Greg uh, Anderson. I have to say, um, Eric Schnell? Shell. Is there an N in it? Shell. Is that right? Asked me last Saturday, a week ago, why did I, why did I get into ministry? And how was that called into ministry? And I, I shared with him about a 45 minute long uh, explanation of how I got into ministry. But in, in one song, that's why I got into ministry. Uh, I don't know that I can uh, hear that song without crying. Every time I hear that song, it brings tears to my eyes. Because of all things in life, there can be nothing so good than to know that God used you to impact somebody's life in an eternal way. So thank you for reminding us of that. And, and Eric, that was the answer to your question that you were probably hoping for last Saturday. So sorry about the 45-minute rant that you got. But, um, but now you know. Walk into heaven's gates and have somebody approach you and say, thank you for giving me the Lord. I was a life that was changed by you. Nothing can be better than that. <sighs> now I got that off. We've been studying through um, Romans, and as we study through Romans, we do so for the purpose of growing in our faith, strengthening us and encouraging us, teaching us and guiding us so that we might impact others' lives powerfully and eternally. Uh, chapter 6 was a, a challenging chapter that talked about a lot of, um, that Paul used a lot of contrasts to illustrate and explain what sanctification is. And one of the things you have to realize is we're picking up in chapter 7 this morning, and we, we ended actually chapter 6 this morning with the children's message. That was the last verse in chapter 6, the last contrast. Wages of sin is death, gift of God, eternal life, that contrast. And that's why we, we celebrate God and we live our lives to honor Him because He's given us that free gift. We don't uh, struggle to live our lives so that we can earn our way into heaven or to, to earn that gift from God because we can't. Uh, but then we pick up in chapter 7 this morning. But you have to realize that when the Bible was first written, when Paul was first writing, he didn't write in chapter and verses. You all realize that, right? That the chapters and the verses were added much later, probably sometime in the medieval time. So when we get to chapter 7, we think, oh, oh, Paul's ended one discussion and he's beginning another one. In fact, he's continuing with the discussion that he was um, having in Romans chapter 6. And so don't think this is the end and the new beginning, but maybe a transition in the same. So he's talking about sanctification. He's talking about how God works in our lives to bring about reform and change and help us to live our lives in ways that honor him. And he comes to another illustration. The illustration of the analogy that he uses today is the illustration of marriage, the analogy of marriage. And in one sense, it's really simple, because we all kind of understand marriage. We all understand um, spouses. We all understand uh, living together with others. We, we kind of get this image. But on another hand, it's kind of uh, difficult, because what exactly does he mean by it? So let's take a look, and we'll read through these verses. If you've got your Bible, you can open there to Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Paul opens up uh, by saying, do you, know, do you not know, brothers, or I'm speaking to men who know the law, so he's speaking to Jews who understand the Old Testament, he's speaking to people who really understand God's expectations, he's giving them some credit here and saying, I know that you know what God expects. I know, what you, I know that you know what God wants from you. Do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over a man as long as he lives. You cannot prosecute a dead man. When they're dead, you cannot do anything to them. You cannot punish them. I know the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church dug up uh, Martin Luther's bones and, and burned them at the stake. And I'm sure he was very, very, very put off by that. I'm, I'm sure that Martin Luther was really upset about the burning of his bones. Why? Well, it didn't matter. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't touch him. When a person dies, the law no longer applies to them. You cannot prosecute a person once they're dead. They are free from the law. And Paul is using this, this analogy. He says, for example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as they arrive, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. When you get married, you say, till death do us part, or so long as we both shall live. 
you are agreeing in this covenant to be bound together in this covenant of marriage so long as you and your partner are both alive. Once the partner dies, you are free from your obligation to that person. But so long as they are alive, every expectation, every requirement, every duty, you are bound to that. This is very clear. I mean, this is not something that's strange. A couple of things we do have to probably take a minute and unpack a little bit is, um, one, Paul chooses here to refer to marriage from the woman's perspective. Why does he do that? And guys, are you really comfortable with that? Being compared to the bride of Christ. You are the bride of Christ. And, and you know, when, when I think about that, if I think about it in purely secular terms, it makes me feel pretty uncomfortable. There's some uh, gender bending going on here, and, and we struggle with that. But why is Paul doing it? He's doing it for uh, some important reasons. He says, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband. Interesting, he says that. And he's going to compare us to that married woman for a couple of reasons. First of all, when we talk about women in the ancient Near East, in Israel, in the time of Paul, they were completely dependent upon men. A woman was the um, uh, ward of her father until she became of age to marry. Then when she married, she became the ward of her husband. And she prayed for her husband to have long life. If he died suddenly when she was still young, she would be almost required by society to marry again. So that she would have another person to care for her and take care of her. She was the ward of her second husband until she grew old and hopefully um, her husband was able to provide for her through the end of her days, but she became, if, if necessary, the ward of the state. But a woman was completely dependent upon the man. This is the image that Paul is drawing from, at least one of them. He is reminding us that we are completely dependent upon somebody in this life. When we were born, we were married to one person, and then when we come to Christ, that changes, and we'll see how that changes. But he's, he's reminding us of that dependency. Also, um, understand another thing about marriage in the ancient Near East. It was an expectation. In our day and age, it's not really uncommon for people to stay single for many years into their adulthood or even all the way through their lives. And we think, well, that's, that's okay. That's their choice. And God can bless a person who's single. And we don't see that as anything really odd. A, a single person can live a full God blessed, uh, fulfilling life. But in the ancient Near East, that was not acceptable. When you came of the age to be married, you were expected to get married. You were expected to marry a spouse, and you were expected for the sake of the community to produce offspring, to build the community, to help the community to grow. And if you didn't do these things, you were ashamed. You were an outcast in some sense of society. Think back to Sarah. Do you remember Sarah and Abraham? And she went through life without a child, and she was embarrassed and ashamed that she had no children. Think of Hannah, and she was crying at the Lord's altar that God would give her a child. And she had no children, and she was weeping and weeping for shame because she hadn't done her duty to society. She hadn't commit, con, uh, contributed to the, the building up of the community. So this analogy, this image of marriage, we know it from our perspective, but we also have to incorporate in our understanding of marriage a little bit of what they would have been hearing when Paul's using marriage. And that's these uh, two things. That a woman is dependent purely and completely upon the man. And secondly, that there is an expectation of marriage. There is no singlehood. That's not an option in the age of marriage. So let's, let's read again. For example... By law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. By the way, one other thing, taking this from the woman's perspective, um, in um, many cases the woman was not allowed to divorce her husband, but the husband was allowed to divorce his wife. And so in this case, Paul is setting up a situation where the person is completely dependent and has no means to get out of that dependency, no means of escaping. Verse 3. So then, if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. You see that? 
she must remain with her husband. She has no recourse to get out of that marriage unless he dies. But if her husband dies, Paul goes on to say, she is released from the law and is not an adulteress, even though she marries another man. So this image is clear, it's understandable. The question is, what in the world is Paul using this to, to symbolize? What is he using this to teach us? How is the analogy playing out in our understanding of sanctification, of God's uh, purification of our hearts and our lives? He goes on in verses 4 to 6 to explain. So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that you might bear fruit from God. So, he's taking this analogy of marriage, and it's interesting, he's flipping some things back and forth here. So, if you are the Roman, the church, the member of the church in Rome that Paul is speaking to, he has now said, you are the wife, and the only way for you to be free is for your husband to die. Then he goes on in verse 4 to say, and so you have died to the law. And so here he's explaining, who was your first husband? Your first husband is the law. How do you escape the, the, um, your binding to the law? How do you escape your duties to the law? Well, in our minds, if we were to put two and two together, we would say, well, the law has to die for us to be free. In the metaphor, that seems to be what would work. But Paul goes on and he flips that back. He says, and so now you have died. So God has an issue here. He has created man. Man has married himself, man, uh, mankind, humanity has married themselves to the law through sin. We are duty bound to the law. We have come into this union and the only way for us to be free, the only way to break this union is death. One of the two parties has to die. If we die, the problem is we're dead. If you want to be free from your spouse, all you need to do is die, right? Then you're free. It doesn't really work well, it doesn't. Because if you die, then you're dead. So what's the alternative? Well, your spouse has to die. Well, in this case, the spouse is the law. But we, we, we read in Matthew 5.18, Jesus says, not one jot or tittle of the law will pass away. That's not the, the least stroke of the pen. It's like, it's like the stroke of the eye or the dot on the eye. It's that the littlest part of the law shall pass away until heaven and earth have passed away. So what's Jesus saying? The law can't die. The law won't die. The law will live on until heaven and earth have passed away. So now God is left with a conundrum. He can't kill off the law. If the law dies, think about the uh, anarchy and chaos that will ensue. Just imagine if, if um, the, the Supreme Court got up on their bench today and said, you know what, the Constitution, it's unconstitutional. Boom. Laws are gone. And it was not too hard to imagine in our day and age the court might do something crazy like that. So just imagine it. The court gets in and says, you know what, we're tired of all these laws. There's too many laws. Get rid of them. We're going to start over. There's no laws. Can you imagine the chaos that would ensue in our United States as people decided to do whatever they wanted to do, when they wanted to do it, to whomever they wanted to do, however they wanted to do it, at whatever time of day, whatever location they wanted to do it? Chaos would ensue as people chose to do things that their neighbors wouldn't want them to do. And they'd have no recourse to respond. God cannot end the law. The law has a purpose. So the law must live. And if we die, there's no benefit. So God has a problem here. He sees this problem. Being God, he says, this is an impossible problem. One can't die, and if the other dies, there's no benefit. Impossible problem means an impossible solution. Being the God who does the impossible, God says his, sends his son to become the representative for all humanity, to live the perfect life, free from the law. Jesus lives life, he comes under the law, but he lives it entirely perfectly fulfilling the law, 
and he still suffers the consequence. We said that the wages of sin is death. What did Jesus do on the cross? He died. Did he receive the wages that were his due? No. Whose wages did he receive? Yours and mine. He received our wages. You say, but he's one man. Yes, he's one man, but he's eternally living and he's God. And that's the reason he has to be God and man. Man, as, as man, he takes on the sinfulness of humanity that's not his own and dies on the cross. And as God, he is infinite in his reception of the wages, and so he can give that out freely to whomever he wants to give it to. And he has promised to do that to whomever believes in him, whoever has faith in him. So God finds an impossible solution to this impossible problem, and he makes it happen because our God is a God who does the impossible routinely. So here, Paul says, Brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ. We who are in Christ died to the law. God had to figure out, how can I kill my people so that they receive their wages and yet keep them alive? And Jesus was the answer to that problem. You also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another. Now that you've died in Christ, guess what? Your marriage is broken. Your marriage to the law, which you've um, entered into through sin, is now broken. You are no longer bound to the law. You are no longer under the law. Now you have left the law if you are in Christ, and you have been married to another. You belong to another. Who is it? Verse uh, 4 continues. To him who was raised from the dead. You are now married to Christ. You are the bride of Christ. And we said that is because we are completely dependent upon our spouse. We need to be married to somebody. In Paul's mind, in ancient Near East, there is no singlehood. You are married to someone. And now we have been uh, died. We have died from the law. And now we are married to our new husband, Christ, completely dependent upon him. For what purpose? Paul concludes verse uh, four. Uh, me, yeah, verse four here. In order that we might bear fruit to God. Remember, we said that the the duty of the couple, the reason that everybody was to get married back in the ancient Near East, was that they would provide offspring and build the community. And so Paul says here that you might uh, produce fruit, bear fruit to God. Now listen. Um, Listen to the contrast that Paul uses here to the fruit that is being born when you are married to your first husband, Paul, and your second husband, Christ. And we'll talk a little bit more about it after we read it. For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, that's our first marriage, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. But now... Dying to that to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in a new way of in the new way of the spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. So we are called by God here through Paul's writing to bear fruit. When we were married to the law, our fruit was sinful. It was repugnant. It was. Uh, it, it brought about death. And that's something that's been really impressed upon me as I've been studying through Romans 6 and 7, is that when we do sin, we invite death into our lives. We invite a little bit of death. We die a little bit each time we sin. We're, we're kind of giving ourselves over a little bit to death. It's kind of like we're sacrificing ourselves in that way. But he says, we are no longer married to the law. Now, give yourselves wholly to the Spirit. Give yourself wholly to your new husband, to your new marriage, and produce fruit, bear fruit to God. What is that fruit that we bear? In the physical sense of the ancient Near East, it was children. In the spiritual sense, it's spreading the gospel and producing children for God. Not our children, but His. Calling people into that relationship with Him. And that's why that song was so appropriate today. When you get to heaven, what children will be there to say thank you? 
forgive it to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. That's what Paul is reminding us. That is our purpose. Many people think that our purpose in being saved is to be saved. They say, hallelujah, I believe in Jesus. I'm going to heaven. Hooray! And they end there. They stop. But that's not where God stops. He calls us to be saved so that we can come and be Him with Him, but He also wants us to bring others with us, to share our faith, to, to share the gospel, to share His love, and to produce fruit, namely, people who believe in Jesus, people who live their lives to honor Jesus, people who want to serve Jesus, people who want to know more about Jesus. People who want to live their lives in ways that honor Jesus so that they too can live in eternity with God and in turn produce more fruit. Jesus didn't call the disciples just so that they could go to heaven. If Jesus called the 12 disciples so that they could go to heaven, there'd be Jesus and the 12 disciples in heaven. And they'd have a great time for eternity. The 13 of them, well, I guess no Judas, so 12 of them. But that's not why he called the disciples. He called them that they might spread the news of what he has done, who he is and what he's done. And guess what? You're a disciple. And I'm a disciple. And you're a disciple. And you're a disciple. And you're a disciple. And if I didn't point a finger at you, you didn't feel like I called you a disciple, just point the finger at yourself and say, I'm a disciple. Because you are. You are called by God out of the marriage with the law, into the marriage with Christ, so that you can produce fruit. For God's kingdom, building his kingdom, and uh, calling others into that discipleship as well. Paul says that we are called into, we are released from the law, so that we serve in a new way, in the new way of the spirit, not in the old way of the written code. And I think that there's a lot of Christians that are alive today who still serve Christ in the old way. We look at the Bible, and we look at it as a set of rules to be followed, and that if we don't follow them, we punish ourselves, we fear punishment, we, we think about God as a lawgiver, as a code follower, and as a punisher. But Paul says here, think of it in a new way. Think of it in a spiritual way. Think of it as you're following God in the spirit. So if we go back to our marriage analogy and just play with this one more time, we say, you are getting married. When you marry your spouse, you agree to certain things. You say, I promise to be faithful, loving, committed in sickness and in health, and, uh, in uh, poverty, in want, in, in plenty or in want. And we, we promise to be there for our spouse. If we go through the rest of our lives just reciting that thing, that, that promise, and just trying to check off, okay, did, were we there in sickness while well, I was there? I was in the other room. I guess that counts. Um, she, got, she made a mess on the floor when she got sick. Um, I wasn't about to clean that up because I really don't like that. So um, I, did, I did go out. I got her some Alka-Seltzer at the store. So I guess that, that counts. Check. You know, and we're just kind of checking off the was I there or not. Um, we missed the point, don't we? The point that that little phrase that we say, that promise that we make, is that we will love our spouse. What does that mean? Well, it means a whole bunch of things. And guess what? In different marriages, it means different things. Because different people are loved in different ways. But the point is, we're not breaking any of those rules. We're going beyond them because we love our spouse. We're trying to make our spouse feel the love that they deserve to feel. We promise to do that. So when we come to Christ, it's not about just obeying the, the, the letter of the law. The letter of the law is there to help guide us into what it is that God feels, how God feels loved. But don't think of it as a checklist. Like, okay, I said my prayer this morning, I read my devotions, and I read my Bible, I'm good to go, I can ignore God the rest of the day. The whole point of devotions and reading your Bible is to help build your relationship. And that's what Paul's getting at here. He says, we follow in a new way. The Jews followed the letter of the law. They wrote laws on top of laws to help to protect them from breaking the law. And they wrote laws on top of those laws and laws on top of those laws. But that's not our purpose, to follow laws. Our purpose is to love Christ. 
What's the greatest commandment in the Bible? Second greatest is love the neighbor as yourself. Greatest is love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. What is it? Love God. That's what Paul's saying here. We've been released from the law. That's following the commandments so that we can think of ourselves as good. So that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. The Jews were phenomenal experts at following the written code. But they missed the love part. God loves you. Let that sink in. God loves you. What does he want in return? He wants you to love him. When you do that, the rest of the laws in the Bible, the codes, you will do that. So today my prayer for you is you find in a newfound way a deep and abiding love to feel God's love and that you love him in return. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the love that you expressed for us in so many ways. The greatest of which was through the death of your son. He lived the life here on this dirty, sin 